His first marriage ends in divorce. His second wife tumbles off a cliff and falls to her death. His third wife leaves him after a dangerous rafting trip. She could have sworn he tried to kill her. And his fourth wife drowns in a lake. Is Randy Roth the unluckiest groom in the world or the deadliest? Let's recap. Welcome to True Crime Recaps. I'm Amy, and you've got stuff to do, right? Yeah, of course you do. Because that is why we are bringing you all the crime in half the time every Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday. But we need your support. If you like the idea of getting more facts with less fluff, let us know with a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to be a part of our loving, busy community. Now, on with the recap. So, the lifeguards were the first people to suspect Randy Roth. Because it's not every day that you give CPR to an unconscious woman while her husband calmly packs up his beach stuff. But poor Cynthia Baumgartner Roth. As a 34-year-old single mom of two boys, she thought she hit the jackpot when she fell in love with 36-year-old Randy in 1990. Unfortunately, Randy was only in love with her insurance money. The way he saw it, if she were dead, there'd be a whole lot more of that to love. So it's a scorching hot day, July 23rd, 1991. Randy and Cynthia are coming up on their wedding anniversary. They ran off to Vegas and they got married without telling anyone a year earlier. It's his fourth, her second. To celebrate, he takes their blended family to Lake Sammamish near Seattle, Washington to camp and hang out on the beach. Their three boys, two are hers, one is his, though are left on their own to swim in the designated area on Idlewood Beach while Randy and Cynthia paddled their 11-foot inflatable raft out into the lake. It's Cynthia's idea, according to Randy, and his wife is gone, so who's to say otherwise, which should really have been a part of his marriage vows, but you know what they say, hindsight. Several hours later, the lifeguards notice Randy calmly rowing his raft back to shore. He's headed for the swimming area, which is a big no-no, so they're yelling at him to change directions, but Randy just keeps going. He doesn't yell back that he has an emergency or like anything like that, so when they run over to ball him out, they discover Cynthia's lifeless body on the raft. Immediately, they try to resuscitate her, but it's too late. Not that Randy is really paying attention because he's too busy deflating and packing up the big raft to notice if his new wife pulls through or not. Randy claims the wake from a passing speedboat flipped their raft and Cynthia drowned. He tried to help her, but he's not a strong swimmer. It was all he could do to flip the raft back over and save his own life. So he quickly has Cynthia's body cremated and he collects on her $385,000 life insurance policy. Just another day at the office for Randy. With wife number four, already a distant memory, he's already got wife number five picked out. She's a single mother, young and healthy enough to qualify for a hefty insurance policy, just his type. Murder ran in his family. Randy's younger brother, David Roth, was convicted of killing 17-year-old Elizabeth Roberts in August 1977. Uh, You have to hear a little recap of that case because it's just so sad. So police pulled David over a few days after the murder, but they had no idea they were looking at a 20-year-old kid killer. Not then. It was just a simple traffic stop. But his Chevy Nova was so full of smoke, he might as well have had Cheech and Chong in the car with him. He was arrested for possession, and while searching his car, they also found a rifle, plenty of ammunition. Well, the very next day, a group of blackberry pickers found Elizabeth's body dumped in a field. She'd been dead for about five days. David's arrest and the discovery of Elizabeth's body seemed unrelated at first. But then David told a friend a story, the kind of story you don't forget. And why he confessed, it's hard to say. Maybe he wanted to get caught. But here's the story that the friend relayed to the police. David met a girl hitchhiking in Gold Bar, Washington. This is a small town about an hour outside of Seattle. The two of them shared a beer, but when he tried to get too friendly, she shut it down. Well, he did not like hearing the word no, so he strangled her to death with a bungee cord. Then, just to be mean, he put seven bullets in her pretty face. She was so disfigured that they couldn't identify her. She was from a loving family in Hood River, Oregon, but she's 17 and her parents found some pot in her room. They had this huge argument and she runs away a few weeks before her death. Well, her parents had wired her money and she was most likely about to make her way home when she ran into David, but it took years and years for any of this to come out. David didn't catch her name before he took her life, so she was known only as precious 
precious Jane Doe until DNA testing gave her name back in 2020. One killer in the family is strange, but two? The Roth brothers remember their childhoods very differently. David was a mama's boy. He claims their father was an abusive a-hole who especially didn't like any show of emotion. Empathy was a punishable offense in the Roth house. Randy felt the opposite. He bonded with his dad and could care less about his mother. In fact, he told people that she was either dead or crazy. Well, Randy's classmates remember him as a bully who liked his girls meek and mild, and the only men he kept around were those who worshipped him like a god. In high school, he fell in love with fixing cars and driving them like a maniac through the backcountry. Maybe some time in the Marine Corps would do some good. Well, the military seemed like a good next step after high school. After all, he loved war movies and westerns. He wanted to be just like Billy Jack, who is basically Rambo and Bruce Lee smashed together. He often wore a denim jacket and a black hat, just like his idol. He dabbled in martial arts and he treated his body like a temple. No booze, no cigarettes, no drugs. Before Randy joined the army, he got his high school sweetheart pregnant, a girl named Terry Kirkbride. But neither of them had the money to raise a child, so Randy robbed the convenience store where he worked to pay for an abortion. He got away with 240 bucks and a few eight-track tapes. He joined the Marines in 1973 two years before the Vietnam War ended. He thought he'd be some kind of hero, running through the jungle, shooting Viet Cong, dismantling booby traps, but it didn't work out like that. Instead, they stuck him at a desk in Okinawa, and Randy never saw a second of combat. Now, less than a year later, he was discharged after his mom wrote a letter saying she needed him back home. It's called the hardship discharge. According to Terry, the whole thing was Randy's idea. They got engaged when Randy returned home to the Seattle area. She broke it off when she found another woman's purse in their home. Three months later, someone broke into her family's house and stole the TVs, the stereo, the tools, and a Purple Heart medal. A few months later, they found some of the items at Randy's house, but they never got the Purple Heart back. Terry didn't need proof it was Randy who did it. She told the police all about the convenience store robbery two years before. He only spent two weeks in jail. They never charged him with robbing the convenience store. When he got out, he married the other woman, the owner of that purse that Terry found. Her name is Donna Sanchez. She was a single mother working as a bank teller near Seattle. She met Randy when she took her car in for a tune-up. The mechanic swept her right off her feet. He was good at that. The little family of three moved to Mount Lake Terrace, a pretty little community about 13 miles north. A few years later, in 1978, they welcomed a son who they named Greg. At first, things seemed to be going well. Randy was a romantic. Donna told the Seattle Times that she always felt safe with him. He really came across as this protective, loving husband and father. When their son was only a year old, though, out of the blue, he filed for divorce. And he won custody. Why he was awarded custody of their baby son is not clear, but that's what happened. Coincidentally, it was the same year his brother David went to jail for murder. Two events are not related, but should they have been? A few months later, Randy met his soon-to-be second wife, Janice Miranda. Like Randy, she was a divorced single parent looking for a second chance. They met at a Parents Without Partners Halloween event in 1980 and hit it off. Randy told her all about little Greg. Janice told him all about her daughter, Jelena. But Janice didn't have an easy life. She grew up poor in Texas. Her father was an abusive abusive drunk who abandoned Janice, her mother, and her siblings. So she married a serviceman and gave birth to Jelena while stationed in Germany. Their marriage fell apart, and Janice took her daughter back to Western Washington, hoping to make a new life. True to form, it only took Randy a few months to talk Janice into tying the knot. While they looked at houses, he insisted on taking out a life insurance policy on her. If they were buying this house together, you know he wanted a safety net in case something terrible happened. She didn't protest, and they purchased a $115,000 policy. They closed on a house and got married in 1981. Two weeks after the honeymoon, Janice's car mysteriously vanished. Randy collected on the insurance. Janice's life insurance policy kicked in on November 7th, 1981. 20 days later, just after Thanksgiving, Randy says Janice suggested they go hiking. He didn't really want to, he claims, but it was her day to decide what they did, so they trekked to Beacon Rock, an 848-foot tall mountain of stone on the banks of the Columbia River. As they walked along the trail, Janice mysteriously plummeted to her death. Now, two days before that hike from hell, Janice told her eight-year-old daughter, Jelena, hey, if anything happens to me, this money is for you. She showed her an envelope full of cash and checks hidden behind a drawer. Now, Randy was the only witness to Janice's death, although his story changed multiple times. He told some people he was walking up ahead and he couldn't save her when she fell. To others, he said Janice stopped to take a picture and the ground just 
slid out from under her feet. It took rescuers several hours to find her body after the fall, and they said it was virtually impossible that she fell from the spot Randy pointed out. When they finally loaded her body into the ambulance, all Randy had to say was that her face wasn't as badly damaged as he thought it would be. Her cause of death? Massive head wounds. It didn't take a genius to know Randy pushed Janice off that cliff, but there was no evidence to prove it. The very next day, Randy had Janice's body cremated. Her ashes sat in a plastic plastic box in his closet for years. That same day, he filed a claim on her insurance policy. Only after that claim went through did Randy tell Janice's friends and family the bad news. As soon as Jelena heard her mother was dead, she went to get that envelope of money, but Randy caught her with it and he took it, telling her, don't worry, I'm going to use this to buy you all kinds of toys and things. Would you be surprised to learn that that is not what happened? Janice went to live with her biological father in Texas and Randy never spoke to her again, but he still filed filed for and collected social security benefits for her. Randy spent the next two years spending Janice's insurance money and casting around for wife number three. Donna Clift was a 21-year-old divorced mother with a three-year-old daughter. She fell for Randy's charms after he walked into the convenience store where she was working. The man came on strong, like ever clear strong. He bombarded her with flowers, cards, a gold chain, leather jackets, other stuff. It was his patented move, guaranteed to get the ladies, and it worked. He told Donna he was making an investment in her. They married... I guess that was true. They married in 1985, four months after they met. Randy's first order of business as her new husband, get the family's insurance in order. And by in order, I mean convincing Donna to change her policy beneficiary from her daughter to Randy. So not long after that, the couple took a rafting trip on the Skykomish River with Donna's parents. They're on one raft, the happy couple is on another. As they're going down the river, Randy seems to purposefully be steering their raft into sharp rocks and raging rapids. It was ripped in two places and the raft is actually sinking when they happen upon her parents who had gotten worried and pulled their raft over to an embankment to wait. According to her testimony, Donna didn't just secretly suspect that she barely escaped with her life. No, she is full on screaming, dad, help, while Randy is trying to shush her. But thankfully she survived, but the marriage didn't. She served Randy with divorce papers so fast she'd hardly unpacked from her trip. About 15 minutes later, Randy met Mary Jo Phillips at the grocery store. She was another divorce mother. True to form, he swept her right off her feet. He has this knack for being exactly what that specific woman wanted in a man. For Mary Jo, he turned into the world's most sensitive guy. He brushed her hair tenderly. They wore matching outfits. Six weeks after they met, Randy was talking wedding rings. He broke it off shortly after she moved in because it turns out that Mary Jo had been treated for cancer recently, meaning she was uninsurable. Randy stayed single until 1990 when he met his fourth and final wife, Cynthia Baumgartner at one of Greg's Little League games. He volunteered at the concession stand and she volunteered there too. Cynthia was his golden goose. She had two sons, Tyson and Riley, with her late husband. Sadly, he died of cancer at only 29, leaving Cynthia with valuable survivor benefits, enough money that she could afford to stay home and raise her boys. Cynthia was very religious. She did not want to marry a divorced man, so Randy left that part out. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible about remarrying if your wife takes a tumble off a cliff, right? That's the story he went with. They ran off to Vegas and they got married that summer, which shocked Cynthia's loved ones. When they got home, Randy took out that $385,000 life insurance policy on her. Cynthia quickly changed. She was tired, hopeless. She looked worn out. She used to take pride in how she dressed and how clean the house was. After Randy, she just, she didn't seem like she cared. Like his father, Randy was physically abusive to Greg and Cynthia's sons. He'd inflict bizarre rules and punishments on them. For example, they weren't allowed to go in each other's rooms. Why? Because of security, according to Randy. He would take a belt to them or make them kneel in gravel or stand outside wearing next to nothing in the cold. He threw away Cynthia's belongings the night she drowned. They were around 10 years old when it happened. And when her sons cried about it, Randy told them to stop, a lesson he learned from his own father. He wasted no time collecting Cynthia's life insurance and cremating her body. It was almost a mirror image of Janice's death 10 years earlier. Everybody knew Randy killed his fourth wife, but they had no proof. 
but this time he wasn't going to get away with it. So investigators sunk their teeth into Randy's past. They interviewed his friends, his family, his surviving wives, and their family, and they uncovered numerous lies and insurance scams dating back to the late 70s. You see, Randy wanted to live this lavish lifestyle, but his $30,000 a year mechanic salary just was not going to cut it. So he bought most of his good stuff, the cars, the house, the ATVs, with insurance payouts and social security fraud. You see, it wasn't just life insurance he went after. Anything that could be insured, he used. He staged fake robberies for property insurance. Cars mysteriously went missing. But luckily, luckily, they were always fully insured. And of course, his wife's deaths led to the really big payouts. And it wasn't just the insurance he laid claim to. Cynthia's lifelong friend, Lori Baker, discovered that someone had robbed Cynthia's safe deposit box. Whoever it was stole her jewelry and her will. And Randy was the last person to open the box two days after Cynthia's death. You see, he didn't want that will to be found because Cynthia's kids were another source of income. Their survivor's benefits would go to him as their legal guardian. Cynthia foiled his plan from beyond the grave. In her will, Cynthia granted custody of Tyson and Riley to Lori, and the county had a copy of that will filed away. Well, Randy was pissed. He begrudgingly allowed Lori and the boys to collect their things, but interestingly, a couple of valuable baseball cards were missing and never resurfaced. Randy kept talking about how they had ruined his plan the whole time. Now, anyone who'd ever met Randy seemed excited to call in tips to the police. They came flooding in. His co-workers said he'd say mean, cruel things about Cynthia he called their marriage a contract he couldn't wait to get out of. His surviving wives and girlfriends talked about their time with Randy. He was the sweetest, most loving guy when they dated. But as soon as they got married, he turned abusive, controlling, and obsessed with money and insurance. With so many people insisting Randy was a killer, a judge had no choice but to sign a warrant to search his house. That's where detectives found a plethora of stolen items belonging to the dealership where he worked as a mechanic. And then they found a wetsuit in his closet. But wait, didn't Randy tell the police that he wasn't a good swimmer? So why did he own a wetsuit? And next, they found trash bags full of Cynthia's belongings. Clearly, Randy was no grieving husband. But the most damning piece of evidence came straight from Cynthia. A four-page list she wrote before she died. It opened with, Randy does not love Cynthia. Randy hates Cindy. She listed 44 things her husband hated about her. Things like her ugly toes and dolls in every room to her coffee drinking habits and her desire to help or volunteer everywhere. Yeah, sounds like a real nightmare. Randy was about to hate Cindy's list-making habits, too. Fueled by the couple's obvious marriage problems, the cops dug in deeper. They returned to Lake Sammamish and tried to reenact Randy's story. So based on the boat he described and the size of their raft, it was impossible to generate a large enough wake to flip them. And then other witnesses stepped forward. It was almost 100 degrees that day. The lake was like a freaking freeway. At least one woman who saw them out on the raft together told police it never flipped over. The police arrested Randy for murder in October 19. 1991. His trial kicked off in January and lasted until April. Prosecutors painted him as a callous manipulator and a cold-blooded killer. He charmed the single, insurable mothers, and he killed them after their weddings. The Randy's defense team called him an unlucky single father, desperately searching for his forever family. The jury didn't buy it either. So after four months, 150 witnesses, and 20 hours of emotionless testimony from Randy, the jury found him guilty of first-degree murder. Randy was sentenced to 50 years in prison for Cynthia's murder. He was never charged or found guilty of Janice's murder at Beacon Rock in 1981. Basically, that jurisdiction said as long as he gets at least 50 years, we're not going to press charges. And he got 50 years, so they let it lie. But jeez. Today, Randy Roth is still behind bars at Stafford. Creek Correction Center in Aberdeen, Washington. His brother David was also serving his time at Stafford until his release in 2005. Then he died of cancer 10 years later. Randy's only staunch defender is his first wife, Donna Sanchez, who claims that their marriage was happy. She has no idea why he divorced her. If we had to guess, she was probably uninsurable. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.